Hey guys, Tom here from the Investing with Tom YouTube channel. Welcome back to the channel. If you enjoyed today's video, hit like, hit subscribe, and that way you can see future videos as well. So uh, Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway, more specifically their subsidiary, National Indemnity, recently put around six billion US dollars to work in five of the largest Japanese trading companies. So I wanna get into all the reasons why I personally think that Buffett made that investment. And I also wanna talk through some of the bond offerings actually and some of the debt that uh, Berkshire Hathaway has taken on over in Japan and yen denominated uh, sort of bond offerings. And I also wanna talk through some of the general history of the Japanese stock market over the past several decades, talk through the bubble that they had in the 80s, how that has led to quite poor stock market performance over the past few decades at this point, um, and why there are potentially some really, really cheap stocks over there, uh, which could be worth hunting through. So uh, that's what we're gonna talk about in today's video. Hit like on the video if you do enjoy it, uh, it really helps out the channel. But for now, let's get straight into it. So Berkshire's stake in these five companies, the names of which I will put up on the screen here, um, was acquired over a period of 12 months. Basically, uh, this is a fairly common uh, characteristic of many of Berkshire's large investments uh, over the past few years. Apple is another really good example of this, where Berkshire, frankly, is so big that it takes a very, very long time to put that money to work. In order for them to continue to accumulate enough shares to get a reasonable ownership percentage in the company, it's not like you or me where we can go out and make one trade and have that ownership kind of locked in in like 10 seconds. Um, when you're working with billions and billions of dollars, um, it takes a long time to accumulate those shares, especially without trying to um, you know, make big news of it as you're going through that purchase and um, spiking the price up or anything like that. So with Apple, we saw um, that it took Buffett around probably 18 months to make his to get his full position established um, and same kind of thing happened over here in Japan so it took 12 months to acquire the stake um, that six billion dollar investment just to kind of put it in context if we look through Berkshire Hathaway's 13f um, a six billion US dollar investment is equivalent to about the same as Berkshire's Wells Fargo investment it makes it probably about the seventh largest holding if you combine all of these five Japanese investments. So it's a very substantial stake for Berkshire Hathaway um, and it immediately goes fairly high on the list in terms of Berkshire's overall investment portfolio. Now in terms of the companies themselves, these are general trading companies. And uh, when I first saw the news around trading companies, I was thinking, you know, is Berkshire Hathaway investing in like, uh, you know, the next Robin Hood or some sort of brokerage house or something like that. Uh, but no, these trading companies uh, basically help to distribute goods throughout Japan. So um, Japan imports a lot of their goods. They don't have uh, a country which is rich in natural resources like uh, in Australia or in New Zealand or uh, some other parts of the world. So they do a lot of importing. Um, and these companies are very diversified in terms of their streams of business. So they really don't have um, one core business that, that all of these things do. Um, it's not a basket bet like Buffett made a couple of years back on the airlines where he was sort of, sort of looking at one specific business and invested across a basket of companies that operate in that industry. Um, these are conglomerates. They're, they're trading companies made up of several different lines of business. So that is energy, manufacturing, technology, general imports, all sorts of stuff. Um, and these are very large companies um, relative to Japan's overall economy. They are very important uh, in kind of Japan moving forward. And really, these are going to get Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway exposed to really general growth in Japan. It's not a bet on one particular industry or anything like that. Um, these are companies that are going to be um, broadly collecting profits uh, on the general growth of the Japanese economy over time. So the elephant in the room here is why Japan? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons why Buffett went uh, across to Japan in order to make these investments. The first thing, frankly, is Japanese companies are just way, way, way cheaper than uh, many of the US equivalents. Um, it's a little bit hard to find a like-for-like -like comparison between uh, these Japanese companies and really like a US equivalent. But if we look at, you know, just well-established well um, companies with a long history of steady growth, uh, not spectacular growth, 
growth, but steady growth. Um, they pay a lot of dividends, they produce a lot of cash, maybe a business like a Johnson & Johnson or a 3M or even something like a Coca-Cola. Although these all operate in quite different industries, they really have these similar economic characteristics where they produce a lot of cash flow. They don't grow particularly fast, but they're not really declining. Um, they're exposed in a lot of ways to general growth of America. Um, and as America continue to to grow these businesses continue to grow so if we look at um, some really really basic metrics and these are often a bit crude but if we look at some basic metrics like say a PE ratio for example on something like Johnson & Johnson I think Johnson Johnson uh, I'll put up the exact numbers on the screen here but I think they're trading north of 20 times earnings um, Coca-Cola is certainly trading north of 20 times earnings at the moment it may even be closer to 30 or 40 I haven't actually looked at that one for a while um, and similar sort of uh, thing with 3M as well now if you compare that to um, this basket of Japanese businesses that Buffett has invested in um, these are businesses that are uh, trading at more like five times earnings um, extremely cheap relative to their American counterparts and that makes these businesses much more attractive to a value investor like Buffett who's looking to get a substantial cash return on his initial investment so some of these companies are producing as high as a 20% free cash flow yield um, to put that in kind of context that's kind of like buying a rental property for a hundred thousand dollars um, you pay all your expenses, you get in the rent, um, you know, you uh, do all your maintenance, and then you get $20,000 on that $100,000 investment. It's a very substantial yield on that purchase price. And uh, as these businesses continue to grow, that cash yield will continue to grow um, for Berkshire Hathaway and these Japanese companies as well. So that doesn't mean that uh, you're gonna get 20% paid out to you every year. That actually was the case with a business that uh, Buffett invested in in China a few years ago called PetroChina, where they actually said they were gonna have a about a 15% dividend yield uh, on that particular stock. And that investment worked out quite well. Um, but nonetheless, these companies produce a lot of cash and they have the potential to pay out a lot of dividend money um, buy back stock do all those shareholder friendly things for their investors uh, which now obviously include Berkshire Hathaway so overall I think this is a textbook Buffett investment it's something that really has low downside because you're locking in um, a very well diversified business um, if they have one industry or one business sector that is going to struggle that's not going to pull down the whole business so you don't have this sort of um, wipeout risks like you do in uh, the airline business that that came to fruition uh, earlier this year so you have well diversified businesses, you're getting them at a very attractive price relative to their American counterparts, um, which make the investment returns uh, moving forward look much more attractive. So you've got this combination of low downside, um, at the very least adequate returns and the chance for very high returns if these things were ever to re-rate in terms of their valuation up to something uh, closer to what an American business um, doing the exact same thing would be likely to trade at. Now the other interesting thing that has been happening with this Japanese investment which I haven't seen too many people talk about, um, I came across this from a tweet actually uh, last night, if you don't follow me on Twitter I'm at Tom Investing on Twitter, um, have just recently joined up there, um, anyhow I came across this tweet talking about Berkshire Hathaway's Japanese investment and it said step one and then had a link to an SEC filing, then it said step two and had a link to another SEC filing. Uh, the second SEC filing was all about um, the investment themselves but the first one was about this bond offering actually that Berkshire Hathaway made back in 2019 and this I found super interesting so um, basically what Berkshire Hathaway did is they offered uh, this was all denominated in yen so you're gonna see some very large uh, actual numbers up on the screen here um, but converted back to US dollars uh, Berkshire Hathaway issued around four billion dollars uh, four billion US dollars roughly uh, in Japanese denominated and yen denominated bonds and the interest rates on these bonds are just stupidly low. So in other words, Berkshire Hathaway has borrowed money by uh, offering these bonds, which essentially is, is just debt. Um, and they are paying next to no interest on it, far less than the rate of inflation, and um, actually far less than the dividend yields they're likely to get off um, the Japanese companies that they have probably put a large chunk of this $4 billion to work with. So what you've got, if you put all of these kind of Japanese investments together, is you've got uh, Berkshire Hathaway essentially borrowing, borrowing money almost for free uh, in, in Japan 
putting that money to work in really attractive Japanese companies where they're going to get probably around a 5% dividend yield for a lot of these businesses. Uh, and they're also going to have the opportunity for further upside if the valuations ever do normalize uh, to what they might be like in other parts of the world. So Buffett has often been quite outspoken about taking on excessive debt uh, and you know the dangers of leverage, but this is an example of where the interest rates that Berkshire Hathaway would have to pay on these bonds are just so attractive, so low for Berkshire Hathaway, um, that it's a no-brainer to borrow this money really. And uh, interestingly, uh, this is unrelated to the Japan investments, but uh, Berkshire actually also issued some European bonds, um, denominated in euros, uh, at a 0% interest rate and it just continues to, to amaze me that um, people actually buy these things people actually buy a bond that will return 0% to them um, it's insane it doesn't make any sense other than if they think bonds one day are going to go negative and these 0% bonds are going to suddenly you know look more attractive and be more highly priced um, so bit of a crazy scenario but Berkshire Hathaway also issued some debt, debt at a 0% interest rate in euros um, so they're taking advantage of these really anomaly type um, interest rates now next, I just want to talk about the Japanese stock market in general, because it is something that has actually piqued my interest before, and it's a really interesting case study on how stocks have gone from being really expensive to much more cheap, um, and that's resulted in basically um, next to no returns in the Japanese stock market for, for probably 30 years at this point. Um, it's an economy that has really struggled to grow, even with very low, um, basically zero interest rates for an extremely long period of time. And they also have slightly different sort of company cultures and things in Japan as well. So pretty interesting case study. If we go back to the 80s, if we look from roughly sort of 1986 to 1990, 1991 sort of time, um, the Japanese uh, stock market was in a bubble as well as the real estate market. Um, we saw the Japanese Imperial Palace being valued at the same amount of all of the real estate and all of California combined, which is just astronomical doesn't make any sense um, and we saw that the stock market actually got to a shiller PE much higher than the US stock market has ever gotten to so if you don't know what a shiller PE is um, basically um, it's sometimes referred to as a CAPE ratio a cyclically adjusted PE uh, basically it's telling us what's the PE ratio on these companies but instead of using the earnings from just last year um, we use a you know sort of roughly 10 year average of earnings you know try to adjust for fluctuations through economic cycles and essentially what we've seen in the US is that the highest the CAPE ratio or the Shiller PE has ever been is roughly about 40 and that happened in the dot-com bubble of the 2000s if we look back through the history of Japan um, it got over a hundred so it actually got um, more than two and a half times more expensive more overvalued um, than the US did in the tech bubble which is just obscene and it's meant that returns from investors that bought stocks at that point have been very low. Um, valuations cannot stay that high uh, rationally. Um, markets were certainly not efficient at that point in time, but they've gotten more efficient in terms of um, pricing things closer to their value for Japan over a period of time. Um, and it's created this very extreme length of time where stock market returns have basically been zero, if not negative, um, before dividends. And it's sort of put Japan uh, and Japanese people I think in this mindset of you know the stock market frankly is just a bad place to be and you're never going to make any money in the stock market and you've gone from a situation where um, stocks were just stupidly expensive um, I can't even describe how high the prices got there um, to a point where now stocks look very very cheap um, they are unusually underpriced they have a lot of cash on their balance sheets um, Japanese companies do have a bit of a different kind of corporate culture than a US company might which we'll get into a sec but um, really we've gone from very very expensive companies back in the 80s to very cheap companies today with a lot of cash um, and it's potentially a really good hunting ground for um, you know really keen value investors to look into and like I say, I've heard Monish Parai talk about this as well. Um, he actually flicked through the Japanese company handbook with Guy Spear at one point. He went to um, Warren Buffett's office at one point and actually found the Japanese company handbook sitting on Warren Buffett's desk and, and sort of asked him, uh, you know, why was he looking at these little Japanese companies for a company, you know, as big as Berkshire to invest in? And at the time he thought, you know, maybe Buffett is just looking for his personal portfolio or something like that. 
Um, so it's really interesting to see that, you know, that was probably three or four years ago, something like that, to see um, Buffett now actually go out and make investments in these Japanese companies. So um, they're very, very cheap. We've seen um, Buffett actually do something similar with some Korean companies where um, they just look statistically very cheap and he made, uh, over the course of one afternoon, he went out and found about, I think, 15 Korean companies to invest in through his personal portfolio, which have performed very, very well. Now the one cautionary word I would have is that I know Monish Pabrai actually did make some uh, investments in Japan and they didn't work out quite as well as he might have hoped. The prices really didn't re-rate or um, you know, go to where he expected they might go and he believes that that's really for a couple of kind of cultural reasons more than anything. So if you look at a country like the US um, and all the public companies over in the US, they are very, very shareholder oriented and they are extremely concerned with their stock price doing well over time and continuing to have their shareholders make good returns. So you'll see a strong focus from companies that have paid dividends in the past, for example, to keep paying dividends and grow it every year, if not every quarter. So um, there's a lot of effort that goes into those um, companies continuing to do that. Um, you look at a lot of companies that will buy back shares, uh, a lot of companies that will, I guess, run much tighter, leaner balance sheets than what you might see in Japan, where they have um, really as little cash that, as they can get away with uh, a lot of times. So enough to, I guess, protect them from any short term issues, but really they, they try to get rid of any excess capital to, to run efficiently. They don't want to have these lazy balance sheets as a lot of people might call it. So you have this corporate culture where really um, shareholder returns are very, very high on the priority list of boards of directors and CEOs. And that's really not the case in Japan. So in Japan, um, the list of stakeholders is really the same. So you still have shareholders, you still have employees, you still have, you know, all sorts of people related to the business. But in Japan, um, I think you see people like employees, for example, much higher on the priority list often than shareholders. And you also see that these Japanese companies tend to keep a lot of cash around. So, you know, Monish Pabrai, for example, was able to find companies where you could buy them for less than the cash that was on their balance sheets. Um, but that cash in a lot of ways was fictional, although it literally did exist in the company. Um, it's not like many activists would have a high chance of being able to go in there and get that cash paid out to them. These companies like to keep a lot of cash around. Many of these businesses that trade on the Tokyo Stock Exchange are 100 years old or more. Um, and they've done that by keeping a lot of cash around for a long period of time, probably sacrificing some returns here and there, um, but keeping themselves extremely conservatively financed um, and just making sure they don't run into trouble, frankly. And none of these traits are by any means bad things. It's just if you're looking for high returns uh, from the stock market as a shareholder in these Japanese companies, uh, you've got to be a little bit cautious in terms of, you know, expecting more than is perhaps realistic in terms of uh, these companies leaning up balance sheets. And if you're looking at a company that, you know, has $100 million in cash and you can buy it for $50 million and it has no debt, um, that may be a very, very cheap stock, particularly in America where you can have these active this go in and you know get the get the companies to actually dividend out this cash or use it for buybacks or anything like that um, you don't have that same sort of corporate culture in Japan so that's just a bit of a learning I have had but overall really really interesting place to look at companies they are a lot cheaper in general than uh, some of the US counterparts and it's very interesting to see Buffett go over there and finally start making some big investments by committing this six billion dollars so um, that is all for me today I do hope you enjoyed the video if you did please hit like and hit subscribe it does help the channel out a lot so I would very much appreciate that you can watch some older videos if you like over there hit subscribe over there if you haven't already and I will see you in the next one cheers